I thought I would just sort of lay down really what I've been thinking about recently based on a lot of questions and inquiries I've been getting about natural gas and, and the way the market has acted this summer. Um, I, there are a lot of people who seem to be very frustrated with you know, their theory of you know, low inventory levels not playing themselves out you know, necessarily in the futures market and in the timing that, that people are looking for. So I thought it would be a good time you know, before any, since we're in a little bit of the summer doldrums, maybe to kind of just re regroup and take a look at natural gas and sort of why storage isn't necessarily the only market signal to be looking for. And, and I would say that if you are, if you're trading technically, you, you know, you, this doesn't really matter to you. But the minute you're looking at storage, now you're, you're looking at fundamentals. And so, you know, you can't just look at one fundamental. You should look at the, you know, now you got to dig a little deeper. So if you're going to wade on over there, I thought I would give everybody just a little bit of um, a couple of areas that you can look at and that will give you you know more of a backstory than than just looking at weekly storage reports and and a lot of um you know the theory about it is that as this you know as you take technology and put it into any market you reduce volatility in a lot of ways and and we've put um, technology into both energy and natural gas over the last decade. And so, you know, something to keep in the back of your mind, right, is, is that, you know, the more technologically advanced your access is to production and the more technologically advanced your reaction to demand is, the more muted volatility gets. Um, and it really gets pushed down to more granular, you know, a more granular level. It, it sort of punishes and rewards the actual bad actors instead of the broader market. So three areas that I'm going to talk about today and, and broad changes that have really I would say disrupted traditional market signals that that people have been accustomed to looking at are the changes in pipeline flows that have taken place and certainly that's a result of the shale production and you know bringing production onshore versus offshore it, it you know it's just coming from a different place and you know we also have the introduction of our LNG export capacity. And you know, there have been some really, really nice spread moves related to that. Um, and I think, you know, it'll be, it's just worth taking a look at if you have a belief about LNG and exports, you know, there might there's other ways to play it out than than just, you know hoping that it play you know translates into a higher henry hub price you know and then finally just looking at where the production locations are and and how changes have looked in storage in previous years and kind of give a little bit of perspective to it so but first i thought before we get dive into those three areas let's just take a look at what prices have been have looked like over the last over especially this year and and how that compares to other years so the first thing i have here is just um the daily cash prices by year for henry hub and for me the cash prices you know there's something i look at every day Number one, because there's a lot of information in them. Um, but number two, the majority of futures contracts that trade in natural gas are swing swaps. 
and swing swap futures. There's something that you know are not actively traded on CME, although Globex clears some of them. You, you either need to have a voice broker or um, ICE, you know, the ICE platform trades and you know lists all of them uh, on their screens. And it's these daily differences in you know, the regional constraints and supply demand factors that, that really tell the story. And, and I'll show some of that later. Here, we're just looking at Henry Hub. And you could look at this and say that, wow, in 2013, 2014, you know, prices, you know, tended to average a little closer to the $4 mark. Um, and now here we've sat down, you know, barely able to get above three. And, you know, if you wanted to do an analysis, you, you could think of factors like um, weather, you know, if we had milder winters. But I also think it is relevant to um, consider that production is coming from a different place. It's coming from shale regions that don't have to be piped, you know, from offshore platforms onshore and then just distributed out everywhere. So, so the cost structure looks a little bit different and I'm not arguing that it's cheaper or more expensive, rather, you know, it, they're shorter term projects. And so, so the costs and the payback methods are a little bit, um, the analysis is, is different than it would be on an overall investment in some sort of offshore drilling program. And you, you know, just the other thing to highlight is, you know, this isn't any particular abnormal year. You can see that for the last four years, we've just sat right in this range during the summer. And I'll get to that in sort of some of the production versus consumption. But, you know, the bottom line is, there is not a molecule shortage day to day in the summer. We produce more than we consume in the summer. So, so you, you can't, it, it's hard to expect overall bullish sentiment to play out in the cash markets unless you're trying to entice production. And, and I realistically in 2014, after coming out of a real cold winter, the market was trying to incent all of the production that it could so that it, because we had come out with one of the lowest inventory balances in history. Um, and so that made sense. All right, and then just taking that one step further, this is a look at January cash prices for this year. Um, and you can see the kind of, reward and punishment at the granular level, right? So here's Henry Hub. We have some of our Northeast basis locations, um, you know, in California, some of the Midwest areas. And, you know, bottom line, you, when you see big price spikes like this, you know, on any given day, so here January 5th, we had Henry Hub 440. And yet the cash index for Algonquin, which is the city gate in Boston, um, all the way up to 80 bucks. And that is due to pipeline constraints. So it really doesn't matter how much $4 gas you have at Henry Hub. If there's only X amount of room on a pipeline, that's all you can move there. And, and that's really, um, something to always keep in mind, you know, I mean, even though these regional areas blow out or, or have big moves in prices, the reason they are is, you know, because transportation into that area is scarce and therefore it's being priced at a scarcity level. It doesn't mean if it's higher priced, you can get anything there. Um, and so, you know, while we kind of sat here, we had a little bit of fireworks, you know, in January um, at the beginning of the month, for the most part, Henry Hub just kind of settled back in and it was all, you know, Ventura, 
kind of had a little bit of pipeline and transportation problems. And, and you can look at this and tell a story. And I will say that the people who were long Algonquin index going into the month made a lot of money. So, you know, there's a lot of um, moves and volatility happening away from the hub. And anytime people are buying any of these locations via basis, they're selling Henry Hub. So what everybody really is hoping for is that the spread between Henry Hub and any one of these given locations either you know, widens a whole bunch or narrows. And that's the overall game in natural gas is basis and the swing swaps, which settle every day based on, you know, the Platts Gas Daily Index. And that's what these are. These are the daily um, Platts Gas Daily published index. And, and that's what the swing swap futures settle against um, on every any given day. So anyway, enough about that. Let's go back now into... The changes that have happened over the last five years, just to the patterns of pipeline flows and, and, and how to think about that and um, translate that into some trades. Of course, for me, I couldn't play out any of these you know, various major themes that are happening in the market just through NYMEX natural gas futures. Um, you know, it's a very localized regional market, just like electricity is. Um, and, and prices in one region can have zero correlation to prices in another. So, so if you're not able right now to trade a lot of these basis products and swing products, it is something to consider because you know, there are, that, that is where a lot of the volatility is. Okay, so let's let's talk about um, one big change that happened last year, and I'm only putting you know the high level summaries. I I know there's a lot of different, a little more granular changes, and some things that have happened, and some things that haven't. But this is just to give you a broad idea of of the transformational change really that has happened in the way gas moves in the United States. So last year, traditionally gas has moved from the Gulf Coast up to the rest of the market. So it moves through Henry Hub and it moves west, north or east through a couple of major um, pipelines, and then a whole bunch of other different interconnected pipelines. And as all of our shale production started growing in kind of the Pennsylvania, Ohio region, and the problems that pipeline companies have had being able to get that gas and get the pipelines to flow east, either through New York state regulations or just density of population, what they did instead was reversed the flow on a couple of the major pipelines. Um, and so instead of gas flowing from Henry Hub up towards the Northeast, which is a major demand center, it's now flowing out of the shale region towards the Gulf Coast. Um, because it needs to get to a liquid pricing point. So, and it, it's a significant amount of volume. So, so that was a huge change that took place really sort of the end of 2017 and various stages of this are still coming online. Um, another segment the, an expansion that happened is what people like to call the AIM expansion. And it was to be able to get some of this gas to the Northeast market. And so a lateral was built along here just to try to be able to feed some of that gas over to the Northeast markets. 
What that means is that instead of gas flowing from Henry Hub all the way out to these Northeast markets, they were able to tap into a lot of the shale production and feed that over. In both cases, moving production south and moving it east, it essentially backs out a Henry Hub molecule. That's a molecule that doesn't need to flow in that direction and ends up at some level getting trapped down at the hub um, and needing to find another outlet. And then I, you might have heard a lot of people talking about the Rover pipeline and, and it's had you know, various regulatory issues in implementation you know, over the last year and this year. But essentially what I'm trying to highlight here is, is that there is another way to move gas, again, out of the shale producing region to a consumption region or a storage area. So there is a bit more storage um, capacity moving in this direction and the green area is, is really highlighting that. So again, gas that used to come from Henry Hub and move up to these markets is now being met a bit more with um, shale gas. And of course, you know, the, the, by no way are all the pipelines in place and, and there's still a long way to go. And, and now we add into it um, the Permian production and, and trying to get that gas over to Henry Hub there's a lot of gas trying to get to Henry Hub, um, just like there's a lot of oil trying to get down to the Gulf Coast because that's the export outlet. Um, and if we're feeding now some of our major demand centers with local production, um, that sort of frees up some of the Southern production for things like LNG exports. Um, Okay, and you know, just to further highlight on top of you know the pipeline flow changes or you know why they came about, you can see really the growth and the decline in production, right? So here was our traditional offshore natural gas production that would come on shore down along the Gulf Coast, and and that's just been in decline. Um, in the last 10, 20 years. Meanwhile, all along in the Marcellus, um, in Ohio and Pennsylvania, basically offset that decline. And Texas, you know, for the most part, remaining fairly stable. So all of the increase is in a market area, you know, in a consumption area, a very densely populated area. And so it no longer needs to rely 100% on moving gas offshore through Louisiana onto major pipelines. And, you know, the thing is, the longer distance that you go on a pipeline, the more money you pay. So, you know, people don't build pipelines and, and give away that transport for free. So, you find that you know point A to point B versus point A to point C, it's based on distance. Um, so now that you don't have to serve it all the way from the Gulf Coast, you know, you're, you're eliminating some of that transport cost that has always been built into prices um, in a way. All right, and so now just to you know, continue with the theme, let's just take a look at the major shale regions. And, and like I said, um, you know, we used to rely heavily down here on you know, these offshore coming online and being distributed to the rest of the country. Um, and this, the map next to it is, I, I'm trying to highlight where some of the key um, basis futures contracts are located. I know sometimes people hear about like Algonquin or Dominion, you hear about various hubs and, and it's sometimes nice to have uh, a visual to see where some of these trading hubs are um, related to where the producing 
regions are. Um, and again, you can see in, in this Appalachian Shale region, you've got these four main hubs that you've been able to see the impact on prices over year over the years. Um, specifically in you know Lady Hub and Techco M3. Um, not TGPL 300 leg is still um, you know, needs an outlet, but for the most part, you've been able to see that those prices are coming more in line with Henry Hub prices. Additionally, you know, under the old market, when we brought gas in offshore and then sent it up and across the country, most of these locations would price at Henry Hub Plus, and the plus is the cost of transportation. And now what you'll see is so many of these areas, but for constrained times, will price at Henry Hub minus. And that's just an indication that you have to subtract the cost of the you know Henry Hub to get it from here down to the Henry Hub. So that's also an indication that the flow of where gas is moving has changed. And as a result, you know, we've got all this gas coming from the Appalachian region down, you know, south. We have this Niobra, Niobrara shale region and, and the Rockies, and, and they're looking for an outlet, you know, either trying to go south or move it over to California. Um, and then, you know, we have our Permian area. And at the moment, there's not a real good way to move that gas um, to Henry Hub. It's very expensive, which is why it trades at such a discount to Henry Hub. There are certainly pipelines that are looking to be able to get a little bit more direct access. And so that again will change the relationships. Um, but for now, the outlets that this shale gas has is either to move to California um, or kind of take the long way around and move itself up north, which of course is now being fed by Marcellus shale. So a lot of the moving parts have um, essentially backed out traditional supply that has come from the Henry Hub. Okay, and then just to take a look at that one more way. So here are or just a chart of the daily cash prices for the summer so far. So the beginning of April, um, which is April through October is considered the summer season in gas. Um, and you can see that the coast, the East Coast and the West Coast, you know, kind of bookend the, the summer so far on constraints. And if you remember the beginning of April, we actually had some cold weather and demand lingered a bit longer out east than it normally would have and kind of exacerbated some of those traditional constraints, pipeline constraints. And now we've had the heat out in Southern California coupled with their, um, some of their natural gas storage issues and logistic issues. And so, that's where you look, you know, those are the types of things you're looking to uncover is, you know, where are the pain points? And do I take that as a signal for Henry Hub? And, you know, generally the answer is no, because if you could get it there, the price would not be spiking to that extent. So um, it, it's more of an indication of, I mean, I would imagine that um, basis, SoCal basis is continuing to widen out. And that has actually been a very um, interesting trade so far this year is long SoCal basis futures because it's certainly showing that people expect this, these issues to impact future prices, whether it's through um, storage levels being too low. And I think we saw today in the storage number that came out, they drew seven in the Pacific region. 
And that's no surprise, right? You would expect that they're drawing gas down if you know prices are spiking that high. Uh, it's just an economic decision, right? You'd rather take a cheaper molecule out of storage versus um, you know try to buy it in the spot market. So to the extent that that was possible, um, that would happen, and and we saw that show up today in that regional um, storage number, which is really why we missed. I think we're off by about seven or 10 from expectations and the Pacific normally, which might inject one or two for the week, actually drew seven. So that that's really where the shortage is. And it's you know why you know the market doesn't always react to a lower number the way you think it would. Um, but I bet if you pulled up the winter basis, you would in SoCal, you would see some moves in that market. Okay, and another thing that we've seen um, happen over the last couple of years, and yeah, I, I ran these numbers the other day, and I'm glad that they kind of came out, you know, where my intuition was suggesting. Um, so once, so basically, I was looking at the correlation to daily cash prices and one of these hubs um, in the Marcellus area that now has some outlets with pipeline flow reversals. You'd expect that its prices now would correlate a little bit better with Henry Hub. And of course, that's the case, right? So, you know, we had some really dismal looking cash prices the last two years up in the Northeast as production was coming online and there's nowhere you know, to move it, just like we are seeing right now in the Permian. Um, but as it's now been six or so months that you know, the markets had time to figure out how, how to make all of these logistics work, we're seeing a little bit higher and stronger correlation between um, some of the Northeast prices and Henry Hub. And, that, and that's cash prices. And so now let's look at futures prices at Henry Hub versus um, the Northeast. So again, we're looking at these main um, pricing hubs that are around the Appalachian region, Dominion South, Lady Hub, and Techco M3. I always list Algonquin. Um, but it is certainly a constrained region. And, and you can always see that in, in futures prices. So if you look at kind of these four hubs right here where futures were last night or the night before, you know, we're kind of all hanging around the same place. Um, you can see these Northeast regions pricing a little bit below Henry Hub, and that's reflective of the cost to get it there, right? So Henry Hub minus. Um, and then all of a sudden, when you start moving into the winter, the two most constrained areas that are also in population centers, the futures market starts to price that in, right? So already Algonquin winter, um, January is above $10 um, and it ranges between 10 and 11, it seems, you know, kind of as the anticipation of winter shows up. And to a lesser extent in um, Techco M3. And here is really where a lot of, you know, kind of the big trading opportunities happen as people are setting up for the winter. You know, there are overall themes that happen, really, you know, regarding to the index, which is Henry Hub. But what you're looking for is what are the constrained areas? And, and I guess if I had, Put this together again this morning i might have added the socal um, futures on here too and you could see what some of those constrained futures prices are looking at and and i'll come back to this a little bit in the future and, and talk a little bit more about this relationship of algonquin pricing to lng prices because bottom line without more pipeline capacity the alternatives that this Northeast market has is to import LNG or to run fuel oil. And both of those are reflected in these futures prices, which is why they kind of hit a level. 
and you wonder like, what's so magical about that level? It's, you know, it's being competitive with its alternative fuel sources. Okay, and I thought another way to look at this would be to just look at the shape of natural gas consumption by month and you know, kind of layer on top of that, the shape of the futures curve. So obviously we're sitting here kind of in our, we're just approaching September and October, you know, which kind of rival May and June as the low natural gas demand months. Um, and you see the curves are pretty flat. And then the minute we get into our high demand months, that's, you know, the futures curve, since we don't, know exactly what weather will look like, all you can do is, is know that demand will be higher and, and kind of price accordingly. And it really is an interesting market, these basis locations that have extreme premiums to them, watching how they trade as you get closer to some of these winter months and have a better idea of the overall um, temperature of the market, let's say, or, or temperature of storage and also um, weather, you know, as you get closer. You, and, at, you know, the further you get along in winter, you kind of know how much you have left in savings and you get less and less worried. But heading into winter, you know, bottom line is people want that savings and they're afraid to let it go. And so the market has to move up to entice that. All right, so bottom line in all of that long-winded story is that supply is moving towards, um, is now moving towards Henry Hub versus away from it. And, and that has some really interesting impacts. And you know, I think if you take a look at it and we're, you know, follow some of these prices every day, you would see, um, the volatility and, and the opportunity that, that lies in those markets. Okay, so the next the other thing that I've heard people talking about is, and that impacts, should impact Henry Hub prices or natural gas futures is the LNG markets. And, you know, the amount of times that I hear about the amount of LNG that we're exporting last year versus this year and and you know how that should translate into prices um, is, is kind of funny. So I thought I would go through at least the way you know the complex is structured and and how I I think through where the trading opportunities will be related to LNG besides just the equities. So at a first look here, you can see, um, I call this sort of the complex of natural gas um, versus international. And of course, that's the hope that we get our local prices more in tune with world prices, the way that we have been able to with crude oil. So, so I kind of consider these, I don't know, five, main locations when I look at the LNG complex. So you have Henry Hub, of course you have UK natural gas and depending on their storage situation and their supply demand situation, they're in the market for LNG generally in the winter. Same thing, um, you know, in Asia, they're certainly always in the market for LNG, but you know, the, during the winter, you know, their demand goes up and, and you can kind of see the curve reflect that. And then there's that Algonquin, our, our Northeast location, trying to, you know, just hang out there a little bit in, you know, the range of LNG prices, acknowledging that if demand hits a certain level, that's where its alternative for supply comes from. Um, and, and to be honest with you, it's kind of a shame if you think about it that, you know, we have all of this natural gas and all of this production here in the Northeast, but just can't get the infrastructure figured out um, and approved to move it there. And so, 
you know, the Northeast is always stuck being in competition um, for global supplies. I feel like I remember last this last winter, I, there might have, was there a story that one of our LNG cargos was from Russia. That, that could have been something else. But, you know, it's it's not as if we're putting it, you know, on a tanker down in the Gulf Coast and moving it directly to the Northeast, um, you know, Jones Act, ships and everything. So, so I, I always include that in here because you can kind of see there's a breaking point and, and this far in advance, you know, every single day you look at the curves, you know, you've got a Algonquin right up there kind of, you know, waving the flag like, I might need you. Okay, so, so taking that curve, let's look at Hen the 12 month Henry Hub futures strip last year versus this year. So last year, as of July 31st, the 12 month future strip for Henry Hub is the dotted line. And this year, as of July 31st, the 12 month strip is the solid line. And then the same go holds true for um, a, the a, JKM futures contract, which is the Asian LNG futures contract. So you can see um, the, the huge difference in moves year on year over prices. And the reason that doesn't translate itself today into Henry Hub prices is due to the fact that liquefaction capacity is a fixed amount right now in the US. So we've brought on, you know, Chenier has brought on some liquefaction plants and, and there's some other, a couple other scheduled. And to the extent that that's our capacity, that is all that we can convert. And most of them are sold on long-term contracts that have a tolling fee or a liquefaction fee. Um, plus, you know, they pay 115% of the NYMEX Henry Hub price. And most of that's due to the fact that you lose about 10% of the gas in the liquefaction and the transport. So you have to build that into your purchase price. And then on top of it, you have to transport it. So this, you know, you can, this tells me that oil prices have gone up, which Asian LNG futures compete with, but you know, so has the demand globally. And we're only able to participate in X amount. And so at some level, this spread can go as wide as it wants until we bring new plants online. Um, and that's looking at the timing of those plants is when you should look at these, at this spread. Um, you know, it was kind of a no brainer last year, you know, thinking about what was happening in the in oil prices and in the curve and, and what was happening globally with demand and, and, you know, what our known schedule was of bringing on liquef liquefaction plants. Okay, so you can also see I have the same chart. It's the same 12 month strip in 2017 versus 2018. Um, and again, there's our Henry Hub, not a lot of movement. Um, and then we have, it only looks bigger here because the scale is different. Um, so it looks, oops, looks a little bit bigger, but same thing as, um, you know, Asian LNG prices have moved up or I'll just call them global. So does the UK natural gas curve um, because they're more, if, if, they're, if you are an import market, then you need to compete with import prices. If you're an export market, you know, then you're not, you're only tied to ex, you know, international markets to the extent that you have the capacity to get it there. And you know, we see that in crude oil, right? We have X amount of ability to export crude oil um, or we can refine it into products and export that. And so spreads between Brent and WTI have some sort of, you can you know, trade that spread, but at some level, you know, we only can get so much out of the Gulf Coast. So, 
All right. So, um, and then there is a U.S. Gulf Coast LNG futures contract. Of course, it's a little um, nebulous in that there hasn't really been any volume um, that has been trading in this contract per se. However, um, you know, it's it is still indicative. It doesn't mean there aren't any trades. It just means it's it's not as liquid. And we've seen even since the beginning of the year. So here in this case, here's Henry Hub as of January 2nd, and then as of July 31st. And you know, we see the Gulf Coast's LNG futures. I hope you guys can't hear that. Um, so anyway, we, you know, you've seen in the LNG complex those futures and those prices have been following nicely together and um, have also are giving a nod to the increase in the crude oil curve as well, since global gas, natural gas buying has, and pricing has, has been tied to crude oil in a lot of areas. Okay, so bottom line, you know, the LNG market is really just dependent on the amount of capacity the US has. We've absorbed that initial onslaught of capacity. Um, most of that volume is locked up on long-term contracts, which are take or pay. So, you know, they're, depending on if our prices get you know, too high relative to the cost to liquefy and, and transport it over there, um, you know, the buyer, could opt to not take it and, and just pay the contract price. So, so there is an influence on if our market, you know, the US Henry Hub benchmark contract were to rally too much and the LNG prices don't follow, really it could put us out of the export market. And it's no different than things we think about in crude oil. Um, if WTI was over Brent, you know that would that would have an impact on on our exports. So you know I just look at and think about the same things in here, and and what I'm mostly focusing on is the timing of the new plants that will be coming on, and how that will impact some of these LNG spreads. Not necessarily on how it's assumed to be bullish for Henry Hub. Okay, and then the last thing I just wanted to touch on was storage. Um, and of course, the offshore production declining and the onshore increasing. So a lot um, has been said this summer about our storage, current storage level, um, inventory levels, EIA levels for this year being really at the low end of the five-year average and, you know, sort of the frustration in why that isn't translating into prices. So I thought I would give people a couple other ways to think about this. And so what I have here is it's just U.S. production minus U.S. consumption by month. And you can see the entire reason that storage was developed in the first place is, you know, all, every summer, April through October, we consume less than we produce. So we put it in the ground and hope it's enough for the deficit in the winter. Um, and, you know, the, the hard thing about being bullish based on storage in the summer is that you, you can't get any cash market evidence of it. And so you're relying on perception. And perception is difficult because you it's hard to know when people are going to put their money to work on that perception. So while it might be generally understood right now that storage levels are below or at the low end of five-year averages, it's not known when anybody might come into the market and, and put some money to work in the winter contracts. 
as a result of that. And so it can be a frustrating wait. Um, but the, the thing to know is that if you time it right and you put on some maybe summer, winter spreads and, and can just wait those out, a lot of times in natural gas, it's just a binary movement. It just you know, happens overnight that, that, you know, a level triggers buying um, and, and which triggers more buying. So right now we're 16 weeks into the summer storage season, the official storage season, and we have 14 weeks left. I would say now that we've rounded the halfway mark, we're reaching a higher probability that um, weekly numbers will start to cause angst about winter um, supply, whether or not um, we've put away enough for the winter. So, so we've, we crossed 16, we've got 14 left. The close, the, you know, the fewer weeks that we have left, the more known the end inventory is, the more real it becomes and the more um, money that will go to work related to that. So, so just, you know, keep an eye on the next few weeks and, and how those look. And, and I think we're gonna be getting a little bit closer to some clarity. All right, so speaking of inventory levels and being low, here is, you know, since 2012, um, we have where we started the, I like to call it the injection season, which runs April through October. Um, and it's, of course, I base these on the expiration of the two storage futures contracts, the end of injection and end of um, withdrawal season. So, so my, I, that's how I line my timing up here. I understand that sometimes injections happen into April and sometimes um, withdrawals and sometimes injections happen after October, but you know, just to have a clean comparison, you know, we'll just take a look at, at the official April beginning level and October, end of October balance. Um, and the two things that stood out to me were in 2013, which was our big year where we had the cold 2014 winter, we drew from the start of um, withdrawal season till the end, almost three TCF. Um, and that was, you know, where we came out of, you know, the inventory season with pretty low levels that hadn't been seen. And if you remember back to that chart that I showed you where the prices were up in the four plus range, you know, well into, you know, April, May, and June, that was a reaction to this level that we had come out of the winter at. Um, and yet it worked, right? Because we ended up putting the most in the ground, which is the yellow um, contract. We put the most in the ground that we, you know, have put in a lot of years. So you could look at this year, right? We came into the, um, the season at the end, you know, last year, October 17, the end of October, with almost 3.8 TCF in the ground. And we ended, ended the winter in 2018, drawing about 2.4. So even if we hit our, you know, storage, so end of storage futures right now, which are trading 3.4, um, you know, if that's, if we're gonna withdraw 2.9, worst case scenario, 2.4, you know, we, we still have gas in the ground, right? We won't have exceeded. It will be more the regional um, sort of constraints and weather impacts that, that really play themselves out to a heightened extent when, when levels get that low. So just, I'm just saying, put it in perspective that even if we drew, if, if we hit 3.4 and, you know, we draw, if we're going to look like, you know, the worst winter we had in a while and drew down almost 2.8, you know, I mean, we've been there before. So 
So, you know, it's another reason why, you know, the market, it just doesn't know yet. You don't know what that winter season is going to look like. And, and so it's, you know, nobody wants to jump in before they have to. Okay, and just another way to slice, uh, slice up this storage bucket. You can see, I, I basically said, well, how, what's the average weekly injection that we've had each year for the first 16 weeks? And then what was the average injection that we had for the last 14 weeks? And there is an anomaly right now for 2018. So if, if you back into this end of storage average using, right now, this is where the storage futures are trading, 3.433. Either, you, there's another way to get there other than we have to average 70 a week. And if I were to say any part of this was a bit suspect, it would be, you know, generally, if you look in history, we haven't injected more in the back half of the season than we have in the front. Um, you know, some of that has to do with as storage gets more full, you can't rateably put as much in the ground. Um, but regardless, we're a bit behind. And this store end of season storage future um, could certainly come down. That that might be a place um, to look at at taking a short in the market is is selling those futures. Um, so we'll see. It, it doesn't look like right now we're at um, with projections. You know we're quite anywhere close to hitting seventy. However, if we inject well into November then we'll make up that average. So it's an anomaly, but um, if there's still room in the ground in November, then you know people will be putting gas in the ground. And of course, that's a time then when you'll look at the November, December spread. That sometimes tends to get really wide. And if there's still room in the ground, you'll have an opportunity to sell that spread um, because it will be more connected by storage than it normally is. Here's just another, this is sort of how, what storage levels look like from the beginning of January last year and this year, sort of the same story. Um, and bottom line, um, concerns about storage levels basically show up in two ways. Either summer prices have to rise to incentivize enough production or winter futures will rise in anticipation of a tight market balance. And so we're getting closer, like I said, with only 14 weeks left to um, maybe seeing some of that start to play out either a complete um, disinterest or, or dis a belief that we aren't going to have a winter or um, maybe some good winter forecasts that, that will start to get um, that market to wake up and, and think perhaps it's not priced at the right level. And that's, that's the end, that's what I have. Um, hopefully that wasn't too long. Um, and now I'd love to take any questions that anyone might have. Uh, that was great, Bryn. A lot of really interesting stuff. Um, I learned a lot. Um, so there were two or three questions that I saw pop up. Uh, and so I know you can't see it, so I'm gonna ask them for you. Um, oh, thanks. So John said, uh, hey Bryn, natural gas inventories are at a, at at the low end of a five-year averages, why aren't prices moving up? Well, and you know, I think that a great question. Thanks, and really, it's some of the reasons that I was diving, you know, into and peeling back the onion on this. Um, I would say we covered some of that, and really watch cash prices. You know, people just have a there's a lack of interest in in spreads widening out too much. So we need to get closer into the season in order to the start of winter in order to be able to sort of translate and divorce winter prices from the reality of today. And by that I mean if you can put gas in the ground for 275, and you have, you know, you own storage, and you can sell the December contract for three dollars and lock in twenty-five cents. You know, you're going to do that all day long, because you're not a speculator; you're a storage operator. 
And so we need to tick off a few more months so that that option is not as available. So as storage gets more full, less people can, can play that ARB and that will kind of take the cap off of winter prices. Oh, that makes sense. Um, I actually had a question. So, you know, years and years ago, we had spikes in natural gas, you know, over $10. What sort of environment is going to make something, you know, a spike above three, four, five, six dollars in uh, natural gas? So, I assume you're talking about specifically Henry Hub, because right. yes, Henry Hub futures um, moved, I think, 14, maybe even. Was that in 2007 or whenever that was? Um, I would say it's hard to imagine Henry Hub prices moving and spiking back above that given today's conditions and relationships, but of course those could change. And more the fact that basis locations need to blow out in order to incentivize pipeline builders. So, you know, I think the environment was less transparent and, and there were um, the logistical constraints, you know, had been the same for years and years. And so, you know, Henry Hub was really the barometer for everything because it moved through Henry Hub and towards everything else. Now, price spikes really are around a spread between Henry Hub and another location. For example, you know, the $10 basis or $12 basis in Algonquin, you know, at some point it has to, you know, get pipeline builders to take a look. And it certainly has, right? It's just, they're not, you can't guarantee those returns and everybody, they get tripped up with um, FERC approvals to actually build the pipeline. But the market, I would say, has moved more into, you know, pricing where the need is, and the need is not Henry Hub right now. So, so I, it's hard to imagine ten dollars for Henry Hub for a whole month for a futures contract. Uh, certainly within a day, and I encourage everybody to even trade the Henry Hub swing futures, if you believe that the daily prices are going to come in higher than where the futures contract expired. Because that is what a lot of the plays are, especially in the winter. You convert your futures contract at expiration to swing futures, and that's where you see the volatility and the spikes. So this was long story short, you, I. I I don't think it's out of the question in some of the swing futures in the dailies, but I have a hard time thinking an entire month would um, price out at that just because, you know, it's hard to have every single day average that much. Gotcha. Um, another question from Mike. Uh, Mike said, uh, what impact do you think LNG exports will have on prices? So I think the more, um, it, it will be incredibly dependent on liquefaction growth and and how fast those come online. Um, so really, it's important to keep an eye on you know the the next I'd say twenty four months schedule on on when those plants are coming online and that additional demand if not offset by supply, um, you, you know, it, a traditional sense would be that it will finally have an impact on prices. However, um, conservation and renewables are just a pesky thorn in the side, right? And you know, we've seen that in electricity prices this summer. ERCOT, you know, monthlies blew out to almost $300. And then when it came time to actually go to delivery, the expected demand just didn't realize at that minutia level. Um, and, you know, there were movements of within, you know, two to five million dollars on one contract in a day um, as a result. So, and, and a lot of that comes down to 
people who supply customers are more and more clever for the way that they supply them. They can curtail them for an hour. They can get them to shut down their plant for a day. And, and so don't underestimate the creative ways that could happen, um, even related to LNG exports and, and the way that technology has allowed people to shift the supply and demand around. Um, so I know that doesn't directly answer, but it's, you know, it's dependent on so many pieces. No, that makes sense. Um, there's actually one more question, so we'll make this the last question. Uh, okay. Opportunity Knox says, um, and he's actually not part of the company. Good name. Um, so there's a long <laughs> question here, Brent. Uh, okay. The nat gas market is a deep is is a deep backwardation. The traditional buyers have been end users, hedge fund managers, and speculators. When listening to hedges, the answer why they are not buying on a long term basis is it just is it's it is just too easy to find the gas. Do you think the severe backwardation is not a function of traditional storage, but fear that as takeaway improves, the easier it will be uh, to get gas to desired destinations? Wow, great question. And and I totally get where you're coming from, that if you smooth out the calendars um, all the way out until I think 2020 or 21, it's definitely in very steep backwardation. Um, I think there is a belief that Crazy. it's easier to get inventory to places just in time or production than it has been in the past. So that's one reason people are not um, committing to the long term um, and and seeing the the value in in the future prices being at such a discount. Um, I think people are nervous about the renewables penetration into the market. We've already seen it over the last couple of years where natural gas has to compete with wind and solar on the power grid. And there are a lot of long-term plans out there, especially at utilities and end users that are focused on different sources of supply. And you know there have been tax incentives for those. There's um, you know been a lot of reasons to focus on that source of supply rather than natural gas. And nothing really wakes people up more than price moves. And until that happens, you know I, I don't I don't see it changing. It's just like for how long did have airlines? You hadn't heard them talk about hedging their crude oil or their gasoline in the future because you know everything was coming off and and you know we had ample glut of supply and now all of a sudden that's hitting the narrative again and and so you know i wouldn't be surprised to see something like that happen again but right now you know the focus is on either reducing demand through creative ways or finding alternative sources of supply and and those have their own train wrecks to them too but that's for another day Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, great answer. Uh, and, you know, thank you very much for taking the time. It was a great uh, presentation, a lot of great information I learned. Dude, we did um, a webinar you know, um, we look forward to having another presentation in the future with Bryn. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Glad to be here.